Hey everybody, welcome to week four, our last week in the series, Goliath Must Fall. And we've been having an incredible series. And I know some of you, this has been different for us. And, and some of you maybe have just been joining us wondering if I ever teach, if the pastor ever works. And that's true, we do, I do. I'll be teaching next week for Mother's Day and I'm very excited about that. But today, we're, this last week, we're gonna be tackling the Goliath of sex and human trafficking. This is a huge deal in our community and of course around the world. A few months ago, the staff and I were at a conference and we heard Danielle Strickland for the first time and we were blown away. She is leading the charge in the anti-human trafficking in Canada. She's with the Salvation Army in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. And she is going to be helping us discover ways in which we can be involved in stopping this injustice. I am honored and I am excited to welcome to our stage, and would you help me and join me in welcoming Danielle Strickland. Good evening. Uh, it's such a joy to be with you. Actually, after this service, I'd like to join your church, if that's okay. Is that all right? Anything named Hope is good with me. I'm telling you that right now. And also, Goliath must fall. Hello. <laughs> he must that uncircumcised Philistine. <laughs> Don't you just, like, sometimes my son and I, we have a weird family, but my son Zion, he's 12, and he kind of grew up in some weird circumstances, and anyway, sometimes we just call things uncircumcised Philistines just for fun. <laughs> it's like code, you know, that uncircumcised Philistine. I just love that. It's David's great uh, curse word to Goliath. Because uh, he's going down, right? He cannot stand before a living God, and it's true. Uh, I'm, I'm going to talk to you about a, a great thing the Lord put on my heart, actually, is the abolishing of human trafficking in our lifetime. Uh, there are 27 million slaves in the world today. Uh, that's more slaves today than in all the transatlantic slave uh, trade together in history. It's more slaves today than in all of history put together. I mean, it, this is a kind of uh, predicament that when history shines its light on our generation, it's gonna ask us some stuff. And one of the things history is gonna ask this generation is what we did about it. I mean, literally, your grandkids are gonna say, hey, remember that? What did you do? Where were you when that was happening? Where were you when all of those women around the world were being exploited? Where were you when people started to become a commodity where they were bought and sold? So I'm, I'm part of a, a movement. The Salvation Army is uh, dedicated uh, for 150 years now against the, the, uh, the, the thing of slavery. Actually, one of my favorite stories of Salvation Army history, you may not know much about the Salvation Army, but here, let me fill you in, because this Goliath must fall thing is just like, it inspires me to go a little crazy. But in 1902, the Salvation Army opened in Japan. And in Japan at the time, there was uh, actually the, one of the largest open brothel systems, and uh, very similar to Thailand. If you go to Bangkok, you can go to the sex industry there. And it's this massive, it's about 28,000 enslaved girls, really. And they're basically indebted to sexual servitude. So their family owes a debt they can't pay. So the eldest girl always goes to pay the debt off in the brothel. They're in uh, servitude, so they belong to the brothels. The same thing was happening in Japan. It was a known fact. Everybody sort of understood it. It wasn't legal. It wasn't illegal, it was just how things were. When the Salvation Army had 50, I want you to repeat after me, five zero. That's 50. Just turn to someone beside you and say, she really is good at math. <laughs> right, 50 Salvation Army people existed in that uh, city at the time, and they, they decided they got a, a registration from Japan to be an official church and charity uh, in Japan, and they sent over an English commander to kind of run the thing. And when he arrived on the shores of Japan, he said to the Japanese Salvation Army people, he said, you know, what, what should we be about in Japan? What is the Lord saying to you? And the Japanese guy, he's just like phenomenal, like, you know, absolutely phenomenal man. He says, the Lord's spoken to us, and the Lord wants us to shut the brothel system down. The English commander looked at all 50 Japanese Salvationists and himself, and he sort of said, oh, that's so lovely. Good chap. But maybe we should think of something more realistic. And uh, the Japanese commander, he said, look, I think you, we really, you need to pray with us because God's really spoken this, and we're not going to leave this alone. We believe that God raised up the Salvation Army in order to shut down this brothel system. There were 30,000 girls for sale. Uh, so they, had, they started to pray. Now look, I want to tell you right, this right now, that prayer is one of the most dangerous things to do if you mean it. 
If you wanna actually do something about human trafficking, here's what you can start doing, pray. I guarantee you, you will get a strategy from God because if God has heard any cry, he's heard the cry of 27 million slaves in the world and he will so motivate you and so disturb you and so disrupt your peace as to change the world. That's what he wants to do. And so this commander, silly man that he was, decided to pray with them. And as he prayed with them all night long, they had this fiery prayer meeting and the Lord spoke to them again and said, I've raised up the Salvation Army, all 50, of you in Japan for this reason and this reason alone. And the commander is like, I think you guys are right. What are we going to do? So they catched up a plan. You want to know the plan? It's very complicated. What they did was they got a bass drum. (laughs) I'm not, I'm not making this up. You couldn't make this up if you tried. I'm telling you, they got a big bass drum and all 50 salvations. They prayed all night long. They made a, a magazine called Why Women Shouldn't Be Bought and Sold. They made this magazine. They made a million copies of the magazine. They made a million copies of the magazine, all 50 of them, and they handed them out to every Japanese person they could find, which were many, and they called the, poli- they called the press, and they said to the press, we are staging a brothel invasion this Saturday. You might be interested. On Saturday, after an all-night prayer meeting, they got their bass drums, boom, 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 because, you know, if you're going to invade a brothel, you should always bring a bass drum. (laughs) Write that down. That's an essential part of invasion. And so they, like, get this bass drum, and they boom into this Japanese big brothel, and they make this massive circle, and the commander says, I'm uh, offering, right now, he said, I'm offering a way out for any girl that wants to escape this hell. He says, you can come into the middle of this circle right now and get get out with us, you know, (laughs) as you do. And seven girls right away, they were like, what? And they ran into the middle of the circle and they have 50 salvations around the circle. And then they, they, they closed in on the circle. So the girls were in the middle. As the brothel owners find out what's happening, they sick their goons on the Salvation Army people. They're like, go get them, you know? But of course the, the girls are like inside the circle. So the goons are just like, boom, they're hammering like all the outside people, you know? In my mind, this is like a Monty Python film. It really is, even though it's not, and it's terrible, and people really got injured almost critically. But anyway, because what it says in the history books is, and then they left the brothel. And I just kind of wondered to myself, like, how did that work? Like, was it a, like a, <laughs> like a, oh, watch the door frame. You know, like, what, how exactly did they get those girls out? But anyway, they did. And seven, and, and the press just went like crazy. The press arrived just as the goons were being released. So all they got were like pictures of the Salvation Army people being beaten in these brothels. It hit the front page of the newspaper again and again. As a matter of fact, that day they had to uh, do three issues of the national newspaper just to keep up with the story. Japan, of course, one of the great uh, things going on there is to save face and sort of embarrassment is uh, not so good for the nation. And they had, uh, they kept doing these brothel invasions. Every week they would go on Saturday with a big bass drum after an all night of prayer and they would make a big circle and they would say, any girl that wants to come, they rescued 48 girls that way. And they started these homes all over Japan. But uh, the the Japanese parliament actually was so embarrassed this was going on. Of course, the press was all over it. And there were Salvation Army commanders injured with like guards in the hospital because the brothel guys were trying to get them and all sorts of things. And uh, they were so embarrassed by this that they held an emergency parliament meeting and they passed a new law. They said, this is ridiculous, actually. It's causing us so much embarrassment. We just declare that any woman who wants to leave can leave of her own free will. The next day, 13,000 girls walked out of the brothels. That's 50, 50 people in a nation. 50 people in a nation can shift a nation. Do you understand? I mean, you've been doing this series on Goliath, just like one little shepherd boy with five little rocks can, can bring down the giant, right? Like there is something that God wants to do in the world. And one of the things that happens with sex trafficking, which is happening in every country all around the globe, there is not a country that is not affected either as a host or as a receiver, as a transport company. It's when people are literally bought and sold. There's an exploitation that's going on, a slave force that is bigger than we've ever had in the history of the world. And history History is going to shine a light and say, what did you do about it? And chances are, if you're like most people, what you're going to do is say, I did nothing. I did nothing. And there's a few reasons why you're going to say that. One reason is that we become paralyzed. One reason is that we become paralyzed when things are too big and it just seems like it's too big. Human trafficking just seems way too big. As a matter of fact, the enemy of human trafficking would lie to us all the time and say it's too big for you. It's why don't we actually kind of take on some more measurable goals. That's what the enemy is going to say, just like that commander in Japan said to his troops. Why don't we actually do something more reasonable? But this is the deal. This is why I believe so strongly that this is a generation that can stop human trafficking because whenever the enemy presents like that, 
It, whenever the enemy, God delights in bringing him down. I mean, this is God's great delight to take what cannot be done and make it doable. I mean, this is the stuff that God does all of the time. I mean, his specialty is the impossible. If it were possible, it wouldn't be worth his time. It is actually impossible to stop human trafficking, which means it's a God-sized job. Do you understand? And we need some believers. We don't need superheroes. We just need some believers who are convinced that those giants really are just uncircumcised Philistines who need to be brought down. We need some people who will be who they are, will actually be who they are. My son Judah, he's five years old. He's like a superhero crazed kid. And uh, I was in the living room having some coffee with some friends uh, after dinner one night and Judah came in, you know, he came running into the room and he hopped on a, on a little coffee table and he said, ta-da, I'm Iron Man. And he's got this Iron Man super suit. We're like, oh, look at you, Iron Man. That's so neat. And he goes running back into his room and he comes running out again and he hops on the ottoman and he says, ta-da, I'm the Incredible Hulk, you know? And I was like, oh, that's fantastic, ha huh? And he goes in and he changes again. I'm like, oh, good, we're gonna have the whole Avengers, you know, like he, he just keeps coming out out in these costumes, you know, finally he comes out, last time he comes out and he jumps on the ottoman and he says, and he's, he's just dressed in his little tidy whiteies. That's it, he's got nothing on, it's, thank God he wore his underwear, you know, it's like first time for everything. And, uh, and he hops on the ottoman, he's like, ta-da! <laughs> and we're like, you're, ha, ha, ha. and he said, it's me, Judah. <laughs> and he's, he's on to something. He's on to something in this strategy that can change the world. He's on to something. He's, he's on in, in, into something that Jesus taught us about, that actually if we were really concerned about loving God, if we were really interested in this bringing the kingdom into impossible places, if we were really interested in doing this stuff, then we could do it just by one simple thing. We could, we could love our neighbor. What? Really? <laughs> We could do it just by one simple thing. We could wake up enough and come out of our paralysis enough to know that love actually can change the world, that actually paying attention to what goes on can actually change things forever. If you understand that actually the reason why you're on this planet is not just for yourself, it's for somebody else too, it will actually change the world. It will change the way you view the world. It'll change your world for sure. It'll wake you up on the inside and on the outside. It'll actually change what you do, what you invest in and what you don't invest in. It'll actually change what you're looking at. It'll change the kind of coffee you drink, trust me. I was, I was at this conference in Australia many years ago. I lived and worked there uh, for several years. And we were, um, we were at this conference. There's probably a couple thousand young people, just teenagers there. It was, it was fun. And uh, we had this uh, person that came and presented on human trafficking. And we were just like, I, I was just really discovering some of the, the length of human trafficking and how big it is and just like how horrible it is. And they were presenting about how, you know, 80% uh, of our cocoa beans are harvested in the Ivory Coast of Africa and they're harvested by little kids who've been trafficked from poor countries and made to work as slaves on these cocoa plantations. I mean, it was like the worst thing I had ever heard. I just remember thinking, oh no, that sucks. Like my chocolate is made by slaves and we were all just, and we, we watched this video of this cocoa slave who had been liberated and he's telling his story and the cocoa slave says, you know, like the BBC is interviewing him and says like, how was this? He goes, it was horrible. And he shows the scars on his back and tells about when he was 11, he was enslaved in this cocoa plantation and he was made to make these cocoa beans. And the BBC reporter says, you know, do you know that cocoa, it makes this thing called chocolate and it's really, it's really wanted around the world. He said, no, I've never even tasted chocolate. The BBC reporter says, well, what would you say to the people who are buying this chocolate? Millions and millions of, it's an $11 billion industry, the cocoa industry. And he said, you know, I don't know what I would say. He said, my heart's too heavy. And then he paused. And he said, actually, he said, I would say, stop it. You're eating my blood. We were like, I mean, just like you, we just went quiet. I mean, we didn't know what to do. 2,000 teenagers going quiet is like a sign and a wonder. I ran backstage right away because right after that meeting, we had a chocolate fountain <laughs> arranged. <laughs> I'm not even joking. I went running backstage and I was like, call off the fountain. We're not having slave blood tonight. You know, like this is, uh, this is crazy. Like what are the chances that would happen? You know, we're just like, ah, you know, like what do we do? And I remember there's 2000 teenagers in us, you know, the people leading, and we're just like, we don't know what to do now. We don't know what to do now. I don't know what to do. You ever feel like that? I don't know what to do. And every time you feel like that, there's a strategy. 
There's a strategy that God, I don't know what to do. I'm paralyzed. I'm just stuck because like, ah, chocolate's made by slaves. And like now human trafficking is in my stinking favorite chocolate bar. Why? Why did it have to be that hard? And we're all stuck. But there's a strategy that God God gives us. This is a remarkable thing. So 2,000 of us stuck. I mean, literally, it was like the worst production event ever. We're like, no, we don't know what to do. <laughs> Everyone's like, yeah, we don't know what to do either. And then one kid just had this idea. Why don't we just, why don't we just stop eating chocolate made by slaves? And why don't we start telling the chocolate companies that we're not going to eat their or buy their chocolate until they change it? And I remember thinking to myself, simpleton. I never said that out loud because I'm a Christian. <laughs> I just thought it because I'm a Christian. <clears throat> Simpleton. <laughs> Kids. Crazy idealists. Can't be that simple, can it? Well, we all decided, well, we'll try. It's better than doing nothing. That's what we decided. We'll do something rather than nothing. Listen to that strategy. I'm going to do something rather than nothing. It might not even be the best thing. I'm just gonna do something rather than nothing because guess what I know deep down inside of my heart is that God wants to change the world. He invites us into this place and whenever you feel disturbed like that, whenever God disturbs your peace, it's for good reason. It's because he wants to invite you into something rather than nothing. He wants to actually get you involved in changing the world, which is what salvation is for. And so all these kids, we wrote this letter, I remember, to the chocolate industry and we said, you know, we're not buying your chocolate and we were all just like, no, God, please let this go quickly. I don't know how long I can go without chocolate. You know what I'm saying? I thought the gospel was good news. And the Lord spoke to me and said, yeah, for the poor. Ouch. I thought the gospel was good news, I said. He said, yeah, for the poor. You read it. Jesus said it. You can read about it. It's all very exciting. The gospel, when it's announced, is good news for the poor. And if it isn't good news for the poor, then it's probably not the gospel. That's a little heavy for a Saturday night. Let's back up. So we like, we like write to the chocolate industry, all 2,000 of us, and we made a pledge together. We made a pledge together. This is uh, seven, eight years ago now. And we said, we're not going to do this. We're not going to eat chocolate unless we know it's been certified as ethically produced so that it's not made by slaves. It's just, it's got to have some certification. We partner with Fair Trade, all kinds of stuff in Australia, all around Europe. All of these kids started petitioning the chocolate companies. I mean, it was, it was insane. We actually organized a funeral march for the M&M guy. <laughs> I kid you not, with a big Salvation Army brass band, we're like, doo, 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 and we just like buried those guys and said like, we're done with them until actually you can tell us the slaves didn't make this. And we phoned the chocolate industry. The chocolate industry phoned me back and said, you guys will go away. It'll blow over. I said, it's not going to blow over because these teenagers are unloosed. Like they're not going back. Like they're crazed. Their parents are all calling me going, why, why, why? My kids are like, they've gathered all the chocolate in the house and they've thrown it out. They're just like, how am I going to do Easter? I'm like, I don't know but Jesus is alive. We'll figure it out. And so, you know, we're just, this one group of kids, they like, they made this massive brick wall to like, and they just like all of them signed these bricks saying end slavery. And they knocked down this brick wall as this kind of prophetic act. And then they shipped this whole truckload of bricks to Cadbury's office and they dumped it outside of their office. I mean, literally Cadbury's like called uh, our, our head office and said, please call off the kids. You know, I said, no can do. This will blow over. No can do, man. Because <laughs> we're going to do something rather than nothing. And this is what you should know. You should know that your future market is interested in slave-free products. You should know that actually this generation is going to say no to what's produced by slaves. This generation is going to commit themselves to stopping human trafficking. And actually what we want you to do is change the way you produce your cocoa. Can you imagine that within, uh, within 12 months of that move, all across Europe, actually the, the chocolate industry heads all got together and decided to change the way they produce cocoa. Can you imagine that right now in the stores, in at least 10 countries, there's certified fair trade chocolate that you can buy because a bunch of Australian teenagers decided to do something rather than nothing. Do you understand that God's kingdom, the way that it works is this invitation to partner with him in something that overflows out of your life. And is it gonna be hard? Is it gonna be difficult? I remember actually sitting at a headquarters where I was doing some social justice stuff with the Salvation Army. And as I would walk into my desk, everyone would put their chocolate under there. <laughs> They'd be like, I'm not eating it, I'm not eating it. You know, I'd be like, cowards, cowards. Do something, do something, right? Do something. So when I was there, I, I, I have the privilege in my day-to-day -day life of trying to help women off the street out of prostitution, 
which is really just domestic sex trafficking, by the way, anything where someone's commodified, where someone becomes exploitable, right? Where someone's actually tricked or persuaded or convinced to come into a situation that then becomes exploitative is trafficking by definition. And so I meet with these women all the time, and we have this ministry that goes on the streets and stuff and invites women out. When I was in Australia for three years, they have a legalized brothel system there. It's like living in Nevada, I suppose. And they believe that women are liberated by offering themselves uh, to sell sex and that that's a way of solving the problem. It is not a way of solving the problem, by the way. It's, It's just a way of exploiting more and more and more women. It's fascinating who fills legalized brothels. It's all exploited and marginalized and poor uh, women, uh, bar none. <laughs> and so we didn't know what to do. When I went to Australia, I didn't know I was Canadian, so I was just like, I don't even know what's wrong with you people, why you would do this in the beginning, you know? And I just, I had experience of street, you know, getting people off of the streets, but I didn't have any experience of legalized brothels. I didn't know what to do, and I knew human trafficking was happening within the framework of legalized brothels. So anyway, I get this phone call from a 72-year-old lady, Jan. She phones me up. She says, I really need to talk to you. I'm friends with her daughter. I said, sure. So we have a a coffee together. And she says, it's like this, Danielle. She said, my phone number is two digits different from my local brothel's phone number. So she says, I keep getting these calls. And my husband gets a few of them too. She said, it really became unmanageable. So she said, I actually, I made a date with the phone company. I was going down there to complain and also change my number. And she said, on the morning that I was going to change my number, she said, the Holy Spirit interrupted me during my devotions. I said, how rude. (laughs) That's how you can tell the Holy Spirit's a woman, by the way. (laughs) She's always interrupting. But anyway, so she, uh, she says, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, Jam, why are you changing your number? She said, well, you know why I'm changing my number. I, I, I'm getting these calls. The Holy Spirit, she said, just really spoke deeply into my heart and said, instead of avoiding the problem, maybe you should do something to change it. So she said, that's why I'm meeting with you. What should I do? <laughs> and so I didn't know what to do. <laughs> but I never said that because like, hello, <laughs> I'm supposed to know what to do. So I was like the social justice director for the Salvation Army. Of course I know what to do. You know, so I just sat and I did like my best Yoda. Hmm, interesting problem you have, Jan. <laughs> right? We just did my best. Let's ask a few other questions, you know. I said, like, well, while we're brainstorming about this, I said, this super terrible, horrible problem called human trafficking and prostitution and what we're going to do about it. I said, how about we just ask a couple more simple questions? Like, for example, oh, I don't know. What would you normally do if your neighbor was sick? If uh, someone moved into your block, what would just be your natural response? She said, oh, that's easy. She said, I would bake some cupcakes and I'd go visit. I said, how's Tuesday? She said, what? For what? I said, well, you bake the cupcakes. Hello, I can't cook. (laughs) And we'll go visit. Introduce yourself. You know, it'll be exciting. She said, that's the official strategy? I said, yeah. (laughs) Of course it is. Trust me, I'm the professional. And then I prayed all weekend long, please, God, don't let her die. Please, God, don't let her die. And she prayed all the, all weekend long, please, God, let, don't let me die. You know, and we, we met together filled with faith that she wouldn't die. And uh, we met together at territorial headquarters. I remember because the, the brothel she was visiting was an Asian brothel right in between where she lived and right where headquarters was. And so we met together for prayer and we're just like, rah, hoo-ha, you know, like, let's do this thing. This is awesome. And we're like, woo, and she's made like a thousand cupcakes so she has the perfect batch because, of course, that matters. And... Um, <laughs> And so we decide, where I'm like, let's go, let's do it. And we're all prayed up, you know, and we head out the door and Jan turns to me and she says, you know, Danielle, the Lord spoke to me again. I said, oh, for Pete's sake. And she said, I really think I should do this one alone. I said, what? I said, but I'm the professional. She said, yeah, but I'm the neighbor. Oh, she got me. I said, okay, fine. I'll let you do this one by yourself, but I'm going to be covering you. I'm going with you. Basically, like, you're not going out of my sight, because, like, I promise God I wouldn't let you die. So, like, we're, like, you know, we're, like, walking up the street. I'll never forget it. This 72-year-old retired Baptist lady named Jan with cupcakes, and she goes up to the steps of this Asian brothel, and she knocks on the door of this brothel. And I remember, like, I just was, like, praying my pants off. You know what I'm saying? Like, I just was, like, oh, God, please. You know, like, just, I just, I, I just say favor right now. Chicka, chicka, boom. You know, this is, like, prayer warfare. I'm just, like, I release the angels of God right now. Like, you know, if ever you know anyone who speaks in tongues, you call them on these occasions, right? 
Just like anybody, just anything, you know, anyone who has faith, please join us in prayer, you know, kind of thing. And anyway, she gets to the front of this, uh, this brothel door and she knocks on the door and I'll never forget, it was so hilarious. She's so nervous, you know, obviously never done anything like this in her life, that she just, this Asian manager comes to the door, you know, because it's not like their normal clientele and says, you know, can I help you? And she just says, I brought cupcakes. <laughs> And I remember like etched in my mind, I kid you not, I saw this like, you know, demon power of sexual exploitation over Australia go, no, not the cupcakes. <laughs> because this Asian manager guy just goes, oh, cupcakes, come on in. You know, just like, come on in. And she just like walked into the back of this brothel and met all seven of those girls and got their names and their phone numbers and prayed for them and said, hey, I'm your neighbor and I really like you. And how can we be friends? And they said, are you kidding me? Like, is this a joke? And she's like, this is no joke. Want a cupcake? You know, which they all ate. And we found out later they hated, but whatever. And Jan comes out of that brothel, I kid you not, 10 feet off the ground. I've never seen an old lady that high in my life. You know, she just was like, Whoa! you know, and I just was like, you didn't die. And then we just like, we ran back to headquarters. I ran back to headquarters and I phoned like 10 of my Salvation Army friends and I said, quick, the Baptists are going to beat us to the brothels. You know, we got to get organized. This isn't going to happen on my watch. You know, we organize these teams and they say, well, what do we do? I said, well, it's really easy. Does anybody bake? <laughs> Does anyone bake? We're just going to bake some cupcakes and we're going to go introduce ourselves. It's like this incredible thing and like people let us in. It's like bizarre. And we organize the strategy of this brothel chaplaincy. I'm not even kidding. 67 brothels they visit every week in Australia in seven different languages. When the Australia Federal Police were doing an investigation on trafficking to bust a bunch of them free, you're never going to guess who they called as a witness. She's 72 years old. Her name's Jan. She's an expert in cupcakes. Do you understand what I'm saying? Goliath must fall indeed. Goliath must fall. And this sex trafficking thing, this horrible, terrible thing is happening right now in your city. I guarantee you it's happening. Women are bought and sold. Some of you might know exactly where they're bought and sold. And some of you might need to actually get started to do something rather than nothing where God wakes you up at night or interrupts you during your devotions or says, you know what, maybe this salvation thing is actually bigger than you. Maybe this salvation thing actually means to go further and to go wider. And actually maybe it's supposed to, you're supposed to be involved in this thing. And I don't know how that is because it's actually whatever's in front of you. You know, when, when God called Moses to actually beat Pharaoh to take down the world's largest superpower, Exodus chapter four, it's one of the, my favorite verses. It's unbelievable. Or, Moses is still arguing with God. Are you sure this is right? Like, how will they ever believe me? And he basically just gets to this place where God's anger burns against him because he's such a pansy. And actually, it's at that point, I'm pretty sure where God says to the Holy Spirit, I, uh, you were right, we should have picked a woman, you know, but anyway. <laughs> and, 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 you know, and he's just like, and then finally Moses just says, well, how is this gonna happen? You know, like I'm Yahweh, God, I've encountered you, all this stuff, I've had this awakening. Now, how is it gonna happen? And, and God asks this question to Moses, which he keeps on asking to all of us, because this is how it's gonna happen. He, he turns to Moses and he says, well, what's in your hand? What's in your hand? And Moses, is, it's, it's classically comedic, because Moses is like, this? Oh, this is a shepherd's staff. All the cool shepherds have one. <laughs> Right, it's got a silver tip on the bottom. I engraved my initials there where I fell in love with my wife. Like it's, you know, it's, it's perfect for like, you know, pulling sheep back. <laughs> uh, sometimes I scratch my back with it. <laughs> and God says, right, let's, let's use that. Okay, let me get this right. You want me to confront the world's largest superpower <laughs> with a shepherd's staff? Yeah, that's right. That's what's in your hand. That's what you've got, actually. Let's start with that. What do you have? Is it enough? No. Is it enough in the hands of God? <laughs> yeah. You retired? Got some baking skills? That was Jan's 
That was Jan's journey. She's still doing it, by the way. I get her prayer updates every week. And when I moved into Edmonton, Canada, I moved into Canada, and it's a, a human trafficking spot. And all of the human trafficking victims that were spotted in Canada so far are in massage parlors, which are just brothels in disguise, because we're Canadian, and we're too polite to call it a brothel. So we call it a massage parlor instead. And uh, in, in, in all of the company, we're, again, we're doing street outreach and all kinds of things, and people were like, well, how are we going to get to those girls inside? You're never going to guess what we do. I'm not even joking. I'm not kidding you. This baked goods strategy is unbelievable. We visit with baked goods and say, we see you. We like you. We want to be available to you. We want to see you for who you really are. We understand that no matter what the world says, this is not too hard and it's not too late. Do you understand? It's not too hard, and it's not too late. We have a volunteer named Christine. She goes out on our street outreach every day, and on one particular corner, she used to always run into this uh, street uh, person who was exploited sexually on the street for years and years and years, addicted to all sorts of drugs and looking pretty bad. Her future was looking pretty grim, pretty actual impossible. And Christine used to always say, can I pray for you? She used to always come back and say, there's this one street woman, Pocahontas, you know, she's just like, I just feel like God loves her so much and kept on praying for her and kept on praying for her and kept on praying for her. Pocahontas was a, the type of scene that you would see and just sort of say, that's too hard <laughs> and that's too late. If only we had gotten there sooner. It's the same thing the enemy's going to whisper in your ear about human trafficking, by the way. 27 million slaves, too hard, too late. If only we had gotten there sooner. Don't listen to him. Pocahontas, one day when she was getting some prayer, actually saw some light and decided to seek help for herself. And she actually started to pray and ask God, if you're real God, please let me keep my legs. They were going to amputate them. Boom. God let her keep her legs. If you're real God, please let me get out of prison. They were asking for seven years pen time for an outstanding warrant. Boom. Out of prison and into drug rehab. If you're real God, take the obsession of drugs away from me so that I could be free. Boom. Obsession of drugs leaves. Do you understand what I'm saying? Listen to me. It's not too hard and it's not too late. Do you get it? And the reason why I'm bringing up Pocahontas is because she's with me on this trip. And I wanted her to come and I wanted her to say a word of prayer for you because listen, she exudes hope. She exudes it out of her very pores because she knows what it's like to be considered too hard and too late. And it's not too hard and it's not too late ever. 27 million slaves in the world, is it too hard and is it too late for God? No. Women commodified in our culture, is it too late and is it too hard for God? No, absolutely. And how is he going to do it? He's going to do it through you. Your name might be Christine. Christine even hates praying in public. The only place actually she feels comfortable praying is in a little outreach van for Pocahontas. I kid you not. It's not too hard and it's not too late. And what you need to hear about sex trafficking is not more statistics. If you want to go online, go online and read it for yourself. You want to find out the push factors of poverty and exploitation that push women in, or you want to understand the pull factors of the commodification and the lure of America that brings people to this country and allows them to be exploited and used and commodified. You can learn all that in like five minutes if you just Google human trafficking on the web. What I need you to know, because you're a people of God, what I need you to know is that it is not too hard and it is not too late. I don't care what the numbers say, and I don't care what the enemy says, and I don't even care what our eyes see. I know, just like you should know, with the power of God inside of you that he specializes in the impossible. It is not too late, and it's not too hard. What I'm doing tonight is inviting you in. Don't be a spectator. Don't just sit there. Don't be paralyzed. What I'm asking you is the same question God asked you and has been asking forever in the history, whenever he's about to change the world. He simply says, what's in your hand? What is it? What do you have? Free night? You got some cash? You got some abilities? You got some ideas? You have some baking skills? Do you have some seedy neighbors? Do you have some ideas of where this might be happening in your city? Do you have some in with some groups that are already doing this stuff? Whatever it is that you have in your hand, would you please offer it to the Lord for him to use? And I guarantee you, it is not too hard and is not too late for God. Yeah, Tannis, you want to come and pray for us?
Creator God, we just want to glorify your name. We just want to thank you for your copious amount of unconditional love you have for us. Mm -hmm. um, we just want to swim in your mad flavor that you give us daily. We just want to be able to dance underneath the waterfall of your grace. And we want to bask in the sun of your light. And I just want to ask if there's anybody that's in here that's in that dark place that place that seems impossible to get out of, that place that's filled with fear, that place that's filled with negative self-defeating attitudes, that place that says you can't do this. I just offer you to come up and to pray, and I promise you, God is, God is here, and, and he's larger than life, and he delights in you. And he just wants to see the freedom, and he just wants you to sing your song. His song, it's such a beautiful song, and you're also worth it. And I ask this all in his name, I pray. Amen. Amen.